Hello, welcome to Mr. Miles Maths. Today we're going to be looking at the first lesson on set theory. This is an introduction to the symbols, the notation that's used alongside set theory. It's a slightly different branch of math, so you just need to understand what things mean before you can kind of answer questions on that. So the first thing we're going to look at is, um, is what the universal set is. So the symbol for the universal set is this epsilon. It's this kind of weird E thing. It's like a curly E that you can draw. And this is used to define everything that's possible in the question. So the universal set is kind of like the universe. We can't have anything outside of that. If we're going to answer any questions, all things must be inside the universal set. So for the examples we're going to look at throughout this video, I'm going to define the universal set from the get-go. And that means they're the only values that I'll have in this particular question. So firstly, we define a set with a symbol like this. Normally we use, we use capital letters, which we'll come on to, but the universal set is a special set. So the universal set gets this epsilon, this capital E thing. And to define a set, we use curly brackets. So they should look like this. So as soon as you're writing down the set, we write the set name, the letter equals, and then open a curly bracket. And then we put all the, the met what we call the members or the elements, they're the things inside the set inside this curly bracket. So to start with, I'm just going to define the universal set as one, two, three, four, five, all the way through to 12. Okay, and they should give you this in the question. This just sets up the question, gives me all the numbers or things that I'm allowed. A set is just a group of things. So the universal set here is just a group of numbers. I've just happened to pick the numbers from the whole numbers from one to 12. So that defines the question. So any other numbers now are no longer relevant to this question. So the number 14 exists, but 14 is not part of this question because it's not defined in the universal set. So this just sets the stall out for everything that is to come. Um, normally when we define sets, we use um, a capital letter. So to define a set, we use these kind of brackets as I've just done. And we tend to use capital letters as well. Hey, which you're about to see me do in a second as well. But this universal set, this thing here, this is called epsilon. It's just special because it's the start of the question. And this is the universal set. I will write that down. And remember, you may want to just pause the video kind of after explanations while I'm writing copy things down as well, so you're ready to go for the next part of the video. So this defines the question. And you can't have anything outside of this. Just squeeze that at the end there. Okay, so that's kind of means we're ready to go for the question. You're then going to get different sets given to you or asked about different sets. Uh, so if we're saying that this is our epsilon, this is our universal set, I'm then going to give you some sets. So the set uh, with the capital letter A, I'm going to make the numbers and I open curly brackets because I'm referring to a set. I'm going to make it one, two, four, and seven and close my set off. So this just means A is the set with the numbers one, two, four, and seven in it. A lot of the time sets are defined in terms of numbers. Sometimes they might say, they might use words to define a set. You can set this, the set of players who play for a particular football team. That would just be the players who are in that team. Uh, but for now, we're gonna stick with numbers to get used to things. So I'm gonna call A this. I'm gonna call capital B again, equals open curly bracket, four, seven, 10, and 11. I'm gonna call C. Slightly differently, I'm going to refer to C rather than writing numbers down. I'm going to make C the set of even numbers. And I'm actually going to write that down. You can think of that as the actual values if you want, and that's going to help throughout this question. And then D is the final set I'm going to use in this question throughout this video, which I'm going to make 7, 11. Okay, so if this, this is the case, this is setting up the question. Okay, they will give you this, they'll give you the universal set. We can't have anything outside of that and they will give you different sets. We're going to look at all the different notations we can use and what those things mean. Um, so you might want to think, well, this is actually written down as uh, in words, even numbers. You may want to think of that as the following. Now, we know the even numbers. There's an infinite number of those, or hopefully we do. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, etc., etc. So we can just write them in. But when I get to 12, I'm going to stop. 
and that's because if you look at the universal setup here, it only goes up to 12. So 12 is the biggest even number available in this question. So that would be that my number C. 14 is an even number, 16 is an even number, 100 is. But because they're not part of the universal set, they cannot take part in this question. So if they ask you for the even numbers, this would be me done. The even numbers are just listed there, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. So the notation that we're going to use. Um, so these four sets that we've got, we're going to always be referring to them throughout this question. And the first thing we're going to talk about is membership. So membership and non-membership. Okay, and sometimes this is referred to as an element. Okay, so sometimes I will say element, sometimes I will say members. I kind of forget which one I use because both are fine. Um, but it's up to you how you want to think about it. An element or a member is just a part of a set. And we can indicate in this a certain way. So we indicate membership with a curly E like this. And this just reads as is a member of. And non-membership, we write the same thing down. So this E, but to indicate non, we just draw a line through it. And that means not in or not a member of. So this means is not a member of. So that's how we write membership. So for our question above, if we look at some of the sets we've got, in some ways we can write membership. So we can say that if we want to say that something is a member of a set, we use these symbols. So if we want to say one is a member of A, so if we look at A, here's A at the top, one is a member of A because it's inside A. It's an, it's an element or it's a member of A. <clears throat> so to write this down, I write one is a member of A. So that E means is a member of, and I can do this with any, any numbers that I want that are members of particular sets. If you look back at A again at the top, seven is also a member of A. So I could write seven is a member of A because it's in the set A. That's all membership is, and that's all that funny E means. It just means it's a member of something. And I can go through lots. I could do the same with two and four, because they're both in A as well. And if I have a quick look at B, I can just pick a random number in B. So four is in B. So I can say four is a member of B, because four is in the set B. Um, I could say six is a member of C, because six is an even number and C is the even number. So either we think of it written out like this, or we think of it as a, as a whole. And then after that, uh, we'll go for, have a look at D. So there's only two members of D. We'll just say 11 is a member of D. So that's how I'd write it. I would just write this down. Um, is a member of, is the, is a, this is a shorthand way of writing using this E. And non-membership, sorry, non-membership, We use the same letter, but we just draw a line through it. So we could say something like, if you look at the set A, the, for example, the, the member three, three is not a part of A. A is one, two, four, and seven. Okay, there's nothing outside of that in A. So three is not in A. So we can say three is not a member, so we use the same symbol, but we draw a line through it of A. So that's all that symbol means. And you can go through the sets. So for example, nine is not in B. So nine would not be a member of B. I could say five is not a member of C. Five is not an even number, it's not gonna be in C, and we've written the numbers out. And we could say six is not a member of D. So that's how we indicate membership of sets with this curly E, uh, or if we don't want things to be a member, we say this is not a member, we write the E and then we put a line through it. So that's membership, that's one particular symbol that we need to refer to. Okay, I'm gonna bring down my sets just so you can see them. So if I copy this. Well, what if it lets me go? Just so I can refer to them throughout this. So that's membership and non-membership. We also have other symbols that we need to be aware of. So let's look at the union. of two sets or more. So the union 
This is all the members from both sets. So that is, I take everything from both sets. Uh, and this union is represented by a big capital U. Sorry, that wasn't very neat. A big capital U, which looks like this. That's going to represent union. So the union is everything from both sets. So it's kind of like, I always think like union, like united, kind of united kingdom is all the different countries within that. So union takes everything. You include all the different parts. Um, so for example, for the questions that we've got, let me just move this again. So if we're just looking at the numbers in the bottom right there, so we can keep referring to them. So the same sets that we've used throughout this question. If we look at the examples of union, so we'd write this A, union B. This particular set is all the elements that are in A or in B or in both. We take absolutely everything. So we open a curly bracket because we're defining a set. And here we want to look at what's in A. So one, two, four, and seven. And we want to look at what's in B, four, seven, 10, and 11 highlighted there. So we're going to write down all these elements and that will be the union of the two sets. If the set is common to both, for example, four and seven, because they're in both A and B, we only take it once. We don't need to take it twice. So we just need to list these numbers, try to put them in ascending order, but it doesn't matter as long as you've got all the correct elements in there, then it should be fine. So I can take one because it's in A. I can take two because it's in A. Four is in both, so I take it. Seven is in both, so I take it. 10 is in, is in B, so I'm allowed that in the union, and 11 is in B, so that will be the union done. So it's all the elements that are in both sets A and B. So I take all of them. That would be A union B, or we could have something like C union D. So again, I use the U in the middle of the sets, so C union D is everything that's in C or in D or in both these sets. So I need to think about my even numbers. And again, I might want to start thinking of this as um, the actual numbers, two, four, six. And remember, we can only go up to 12 because of the universal set. So from here, we want anything from C and everything from D as well. So I can take two, four, six. They all come from C. D has seven in it, so I can have that. 8 and 10 come from C, D has 11 in it, and C has 12 in it. And then that would be all the elements of C and D. So everything in C and everything in D combined. And that is what the union means. And we use a big U between the sets to indicate that. So that's your union. Move this down. Okay, so three. Again, remember, if you want to pause the video or have a look at things yourself, then you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, so number three. Uh, so this is going to be the in, what we call the intersection of the sets. And I strongly recommend you write all this down and you're taking notes as you go along, stopping the video, pausing and writing things down, and then carrying on. So the intersection, this is the set, or this is the members that are common, and common is a good word to use for this, to both sets. So this will be the intersection, and we indic indicate this with an N. Um, I always think of this as and, it's in, bo it's in both, it's in this, and it's in this. So for example, the intersection, we can have A intersection B. This is all the elements. We're still referring to the same sets throughout this question that are in that are common to both A and B. So we want everything that is in A and that is in B as well. So we're looking at this set. There's A. And we're looking at this set, and we're looking at commonality. So things that are in both. So I open my curly bracket. I can only pick elements that are common. So one is in A, but it's not in B. So I can't take that. Two is in A, but not in B. But if you look at four, four is in both these sets. And therefore, four is in the intersection. It's common to both A and B. Seven is also common to A and B. Ten is in B, but not A. So I can't take that. 
and 11 is in B and not A. So I can literally go through one by one, check to see if it's in both. If it's not, I can't have it in the intersection. If it's in both, I take it in the intersection and then I close off my set my curly bracket. And then another example, so let's have a look at A intersection C. So this has got to be in A and C. So if again, I unhighlight, take the highlight away from B, and look at C, the even numbers, I want elements that are common to both A and C. So we can take two here, because it's in A and C, and we can take four here, but one and seven are only in A, and then six, eight, 10, and 12 are only in C. So common to both sets, that's what the intersection means. And that's our third symbol, capital N, and that's intersection. Let's have a look at four. Okay, so four, we're gonna look at uh, something that we call the empty set, which always people think is always a bit weird. Why do I need the empty set? It is important. Uh, so this is the empty set. And there's two ways of writing this, and it's exactly as it sounds. The empty set is the set with nothing in it. So this is the set which contains no members at all. Again, sometimes in maths, knowing something is nothing is just as important as knowing that there is something there. And so we denote this with either a little circle with a diagonal line through it, or we can just use an empty set of brackets just to show there's nothing in it. The most common thing is probably to use the circle with a line, that's what I'd go for, but you can use the empty brackets. So how does this arise? Well, let's have a little look at this question. So if we're looking at these sets again, if we look at C intersection D as a set, I am looking for, if you remember the intersection from, the, from point three, just above there, I'm looking for things that are common to both. So I want something that's in C and something that's in D. But if I look at these two sets, C is the even numbers. Sorry, I've missed up the 10 there. C is the even numbers. And D is 7, 11, which are both odd. And there's no way numbers can be even and odd. So there's no overlap here. So there's actually no intersection. We can think of it, C intersection D is where C and D are the same, elements that are common to both. But we don't actually have any elements or members that are common to both. So the intersection of C and D would be zero. Zero in set theory is called the empty set. So we draw this little circle and put a line through it like this. And this would indicate that there is no intersection. The intersection of C and D is the empty set. There are no elements in that set. That's what the empty set means. Okay, if you want to pause, maybe get a cup of tea and a biscuit, that'd be good. This is a slightly longer video. Uh, we've got a few more symbols to get through, but they're quite quick fire. So let's look at number five. Uh, so five is a subset. Okay, and this is a set in which at least all members are contained in another set or kind of in easier kind of speaking terms, I'd say a smaller part of a set. A sub is kind of like underneath, like submarine is underwater. Subset is like a smaller part underneath the set. Um, and again, we're going to use A, B, C, and D for this. So let's have a little look at which ones we can see. Um, and our notation for a subset, sorry, is a C. I always kind of think like contained in. It's the non mathsy way of thinking about it. But contained in. And you'll see what I mean, hopefully, when I write this down. Uh, so, uh, if we look at uh, the sets D and B, uh, B, for example, so here is D and here is B, you can hopefully see that B's uh, bigger set has got 4, 7, 10, and 11. There's four elements or members of, of B. In D, there's only two. But D, 7, and 11 are both members of B. So B, D is kind of entirely contained within B. B is like a bigger part, bigger version. D is like a smaller part of the set B. So we can say that D is a subset of B. And we would write it like this, because all the elements of D, both seven and 11, are in the set B. 
So D is entirely within B and therefore D is a subset of B. That's what subset means. Um, there's a kind of cool little fact that kind of pop up from this. So I'll just write and make a little note of them. Don't worry too much if you're not sure about these yet. But every set is a subset of something. You can pause the video and have a little think if you want uh, and restart it. So every set is a subset of the universal set. Because remember, the universal set defines our question. Everything has to be in, in, in our question has to be in the universal set. So therefore, every set that we have must be a smaller part of the universal set, must be a subset of that. And also, another little NB note, the empty set. And again, if you want to have a little think about this, you can pause the video and have a think in terms of subsets. So the empty set in terms of subsets, this is a subset of all sets. Because every set has kind of nothing as a part of it. So two little facts that uh, come into play through subsets. It might help you just to understand what a subset is. Okay, number six. So this is a number of members or number of elements of a set. And can we denote this as the number, little n, and then we open a normal bracket, and if we see something like this, n a, that means the number of things in a. Okay, it should be quite self-explanatory, but it's just a slightly different way of thinking about these sets. Again, I will continue with the same sets throughout this. Oops, missed out the A. And so for example, in this question, we've got a variety of sets here. We'll look at all of them um, in their own way. So if we want to write, let's start with A. So the number of things in A, I'd write like this. This means the number of elements of A. So all I do is I go into my set A. Let's remove the highlighting. Go into my set A, which is this here. There's A. And I just need to count up the number of things that are in there. One, two, four, and seven. There are four things in that set. So the number of elements in A, I would just write four. Notice how I don't use curly brackets for this because this is just a number. It's just a value. It's the number of things in the set A. It's not the actual values. It's not the actual members of A. It's the number of things that are in A. Uh, number of elements in C. So C was the even numbers, but remember limited by the universal set. So that's here. So there's C. All I do is I go in and I count up each of those members. So in this, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I managed to rough the one from the 10 again. So I've got six things within C. So there are six members of C. So the number of elements in C is just six. And I would write it like this, N with these, this normal brackets around the C. Um, I could look at the universal set, number of elements in epsilon, the universal set. We said that was 1 to 12, so I know that that will just be 12. I'm not going to copy down the, the universal set from the top, but hopefully you can you can remember that and see that. And we can carry on. Number of elements in D, look at the set D. Again, if you want to pause the video and have a go at this, then you can. But there will be two things in D. 7 and 11 are the two elements or members of D. So the number of things in D is 2. And I can also combine things like union and intersection within this. So if I want to look at the number in A union B, Either I need to think about what the union means and do this from scratch. We've already done this as part of the question, but we're, if you remember correctly, A union B is everything in A or B or both. So I would take 1, 2, 4, 7. We did do it earlier on, so you can check back. 10, 11. So that is the union, and within that, there are six different members of that. So you can combine lots and lots of different bits of the notation uh, to make this work. Okay, last couple of things, seven and eight. So uh, number seven is the complement of a set. And there is a lot to kind of take on board, lots of different words and notations to use. You just need to practice lots of questions to get used to this and get used to what the symbols mean. Uh, so this is the complement of a set. Complement with an E. So complement of a set. And this is the set of members that are not in a particular set.
And again, if I just move this down a little bit, uh, that's that. Um, and then how we write this, our notation for this. So if we want to say the complement, we put a little dash next to the set. So a dash, this would be read as. And this means all the things that are not in the set A. Um, so we will use that as an example. So EG. Just let me move this down a little bit. Hopefully that gives you a bit of time to think. So again, if you want to think about this, what this would look like, then please do. But A dash. I would open my curly brackets to denote my set. Is everything not in A? I kind of need to think about the universal set here because the universal set has everything in it. So if I just quickly rewrite the universal set down here, do that properly myself. So the universal set, which was 1, 2, 12. So when I'm dealing with A complement, those things not in A, I want to look at what is in A and include everything that's not there. So I can't take 1 because it's in A. I can't take 2, but 3 is not in A. 4 is in A, so I won't take that. 5 is not in A. 6 is not in A, 7 is, but then 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 would all be in the complement because they are not in the set A. And we do the same with the set C. So C complement, C dash, is everything not in C. So that would be, here's C, the even numbers. So either I think individually about this, or I think, well, if it's not even, it's going to be odd. So C complement will just be the odd numbers from 1 to 12. And then the last little bit of this, which is probably one of my longest videos yet, um, is number part 8. And 8 is uh, the, the definition of a set. This is a little bit less common at GCSE, but useful for a level, and in case they ask it, so the, this is used to define a set of x such that. Okay, and this may sound a little bit weird to start with, but just bear with me as I keep this all on the same screen for you. And try not to rub out my members. Um, so defining a set, so if you want to define a set when we use curly brackets, if we write x with a little colon, this is read as x such that. And this is, allows us to put conditions on x. So for example, you could say a set x such that x is greater than or equal to 1, rather than writing all the numbers out. So this would be read as x such that, or the set of all x, I should say. Such that x is greater than, and hopefully you're okay with the inequalities, or equal to 1. Okay, which should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Technically, I could have decimals and fractions and things like that if I'm not looking at integers. But just to get used to x such that, I write x colon, and that means I can define whatever I want. I can say x such that, then just write x is an even number, and it would just mean x is an even number. Um, but I will stop there because it's quite a long video. Uh, well done if you've managed to get through all of it. Hopefully you've paused it along the way. There will be lots of examples. I'll do some videos on actual exam style questions on this and then how Venn diagrams can be used to represent this as well. But hopefully you found this useful. Uh, it's nice to see you back watching again. Hopefully I'll see you again soon. Uh, take care and keep up your maths. Thank you. See you.